Today, as, as Nicholas mentioned, I'm going to be uh, doing a presentation on some invasive species monitoring. Uh, in particular, is going to be a case study uh, that we are currently conducting here in Massachusetts uh, regarding the hemlock woolly adelgid infestation. So this is, uh, we just started this back in May, uh, working with some ecologists um, that have informed us about the infestation. And um, we wanted to go ahead and try to leverage some of the developments that we had at uh, Spectral Evolution to be able to potentially aid in the, uh, the detection of the hemlock woolly adelgid infestation. So the outline of the presentation will start with uh, a brief inter uh, introduction of the hemlock woolly adelgid and the ecological impacts of the infestation for those that potentially don't know much about it. And then briefly touch upon some current research, not all of the research that's being conducted to monitor the progression and the impact uh, of, of this particular infestation. And then I'll briefly also touch on some of the challenges in observing um, the hemlock woolly adelgid, followed by what at Spectral Evolution, what we developed to try and um, help in this detection um, of the infestation itself. Uh, and I'm gonna present some of the results that we have uh, initially done in the lab um, back in May, and then hopefully uh, well, I'll be discussing some of the future work that we will be conducting uh, back out at Harvard Forest, Massachusetts. Uh, as I was mentioning a little bit earlier, um, the, the hist some a little bit of the history of the hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, for those that might not know, uh, it was essentially introduced into the east coast of the United States back in the 1950s, which has been causing widespread mortality of the eastern hemlock trees themselves. Uh, this hemlock woolly adelgid is, is a relatively unique species that an uh, insect that covers itself with a white woolly substance, which acts as a protective coating for the insect. On the right, on the upper right hand side is kind of a graphic of uh, different kinds of uh, close up zoomed in photos um, from this article, which kind of shows uh, kind of the woolly substance that surrounds um, the insect, uh, as well as one that's not as potentially not as mature as the one on the left, uh, in the middle, and then on the right is a uh, is a male version of the uh, of the woolly adelgid. So, as of 2010, the U.S. Forest Service reports that the hemlock woolly adelgid currently infests nearly one half of the native range of hemlock in the east. Um, you can see in the graphic on uh, on the lower right a display from the U.S. Service uh, U.S. Forest Service that shows counties with infestations as of 2010 in brown, newly infested in yellow, in the native range uh, of hemlocks, uh, all highlighted in green. So I haven't come across an updated map of, of with any new information, but if anybody does have resources on that, please feel free to send them my way. Uh, but I can imagine that. Uh, more of these green colored regions would be infested by now. And unfortunately, uh, the hemlock woolly adelgid is spreading northward as a result of climate change, warming more of these New England winters and reducing the frequency of uh, these much needed cold snaps as, as cold winters are one of the most important deterrents uh, to the spread of the hemlock woolly adelgid. So some of the ecological impacts of the hemlock woolly adelgid infestations. Uh, studies project that the, the hemlock woolly adelgid infestation will spread into the full range of the hemlock uh, in New England and southern Canada. So essentially some of those green, the, uh, some of those green counties that I uh, displayed uh, in that picture earlier from the U.S. Forest Service. And this has uh, potentially some of some extreme implications on eliminating uh, one of the key ecological uh, foundation species in the landscape uh, in the coming decades. So what this means is that in New, in New England could potentially have a changing forest environment with the decline of one of their key keystone species, the hemlock tree. A reason uh, is that these trees are very shade tolerant and provide a dense canopy that helps maintain the moisture and moder moderate the forest floor and stream temperatures. It becomes a key species maintaining a lot of the ecological functions of their environments. 
So when these trees are removed from the ecosystem, there are a variety of effects. And some of these could, briefly, some of the ones that I've looked into is that this could, can include increased water temperatures, which can have not negative consequences to biodiversity and some of the health of the environment, such as the watersheds and other fisheries along the way. Um, so now when there is an infesta infestation present on a hemlock tree, there's some very distinct visual characteristics of, of the decline. Uh, while the hemlock woolly adelgid does not directly defoliate the hemlock needles, colonies of the hemlock woolly adelgid bring about uh, a progressive needle loss and branch death by, by draining the hemlocks of their stored sugars. As some research have determined that given the right environmental conditions, such as extreme droughts, the mortality of the hemlocks could be around five to 15 years uh, if infested, which means that with such a rapid loss of the hemlock tree structure, this can increase uh, rapid decline in ecosystems they serve. And unfortunately, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the hemlock woolly adelgid already infests nearly one half of the native range of the hemlocks in the east. Now, in, term of, uh, in terms of some deterrence for the infestations, there aren't really any large-scale strategies that I know of. But again, feel free to let me know afterwards or uh, email me uh, some, some current information or research that you are currently conducting yourself. Um, but some, there, there aren't any uh, large-scale strategies. And many eastern hemlocks, hemlocks that are infested have shown minimal resistance to the, the woolly adelgid with little chance of recovery. However, at local scales, there have been attempts to provide some chemical treatments, though in natural environments, this isn't, this isn't very uh, practical and extremely costly. Uh, some research has investigated predatory insects uh, that do attack the hemlock woolly adelgid. However, even those have not, uh, have not been able to keep pace with the spread. Uh, one of the ways to slow the spread of the hemlock woolly adelgid, as I mentioned earlier, are, are very cold temperatures. Uh, however, if these regions continue to experience increased temperatures and mild winters, this might not be enough to stop the onward trajectory of the hemlock woolly adelgid. So some of the current challenges in observing the hemlock woolly adelgid, um, this truly depends uh, on its discovery by someone on the ground who happens to who happens to spot some of the telltale signs once they become apparent on a tree. Some of the, some of the ones that that I've uh, researched is some gray tinted needles, uh, needle loss, and branch dieback. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, depending on the environmental conditions, but as the example is the drought, this could be quite rapid um, and can be can be within less, ten, less than 10 years of, uh, of the uh, infestation once it's finally occurred. So the difficulty is that while ground verification is essential for, for confirming these infestations, it's impossible to cover the entire region on foot. Another challenge is that unless known, the passerby may not, be, might not even be aware of the infestation until a short uh, time during the spring and fall seasons. In, in order to observe these uh, white masses that I showed earlier on in the slides. So you, you, must, you must time your observation to their seasonal presence. And it is these times that the hemlock woolly adelgid is either laying its eggs or feeding. However, the abundance of these white masses vary to the degree of infestation, making a physical observation somewhat difficult until those white masses are in abundance or, or decline as far along that there is evidence of extreme canopy thinning. And again, as I br briefly mentioned earlier, at local levels, the challenge is that the naked eye, with the naked eye, it is difficult to observe the infestation, let alone time consuming and costly to do field observations. So only small, small footprints of the natural environment have truly been characterized uh, of, of the infestation. And then finally, there have been more and more research using remotely sensed data to monitor and map the progression. But some of the remote sensing research that has been conducted, uh, some of it that I've, that I've come across uh, provide a snapshot into what, what has been happening, uh, be it already with needle loss or branch loss. But again, uh, I welcome more uh, research that anyone has been doing that can kind of aid uh, in my investigation and hopefully uh, that I can pass along to some of the ecologists as well. But still, some of these locations require a hefty amount of field validation to determine if the decline is occurring as a result of the hemlock woolly adelgid. 
as I mentioned earlier on, I, I couldn't get into all the current research that is being done, but just some of the ones that that I've touched on uh, briefly and that provided one of those large, larger scale maps um, is this one by the U.S. Forest Service. So, so traditionally, uh, traditionally, land managers have relied on a lot of these plot-based field sampling efforts to supply this specific infestation information. Although this is useful, uh, comprehensive landscape scale coverage of the hemlocks and its vulnerability is needed to fully assess the potential impacts on the forest resource and to hopefully come up with some successful strategies to help mitigate its impact. So the U.S. Forest Service has been using and I believe continues to use a variety of different remote sensing techniques and have successfully identified areas of hemlock willy adelgid in their progression. Uh, where they have used te uh, techniques in exploiting some of these physical decline indicators, such as, such, such as some of this gap fractioning, where the needles and the branches begin to, begin to disappear, leaving these gaps within the canopy um, and making them sparser than they naturally would be. Another one, a common use was NDVI, uh, which is the, a common vegetation index that is used to understand the vigor of these forest stands. So in this picture on the right is just a map of the cats, the Catskills where the Forest, Forest, Forest Service did some of this work and where you can kind of see they were able to successfully um, identify regions of, of decline within this, this footprint. One of the uh, recurrent research that are, uh, that are currently being done is happening here in Massachusetts and what we're leveraging as well. And this is a long-term monitoring uh, site out in Harvard Forest. Um, where it, the lead is David Orwig, an ecologist there who has been following this impact for many years. Um, so Harvard Forest, ecolo uh, this ecological site has been co conducting com comprehensive field observations to monitor that spread. And they have over a hundred years of research for a variety of different applications. I'll get into a little bit more detail on this, but I, I encourage anybody to take a look at their website to really um, uh, take a look at some of the, the amazing work that they've been conducting. So at Spectral Evolution, we're currently working, as I mentioned, with these ecologists at, at Harvard Forest, and we have been fortunate enough to, to be able to exploit some of this, uh, some of the resources there. Um, and in turn, we can use some of the develop developments that we've had at Spectral Evolution, which have some of the highest resolution and precise field portable instruments. Um, and with that, we are hoping to see if there's a way that we could aid these ecologists in the detection of the hemlock woolly, woolly adelgid. We hope to combine some of the data sets from numerous flyover campaigns that have taken place at Harvard Forest and hopefully use this information to develop new insights. So Harvard, uh, the site that we were working in, uh, this area that we chose to do the investigation is actually in Petersham, Massachusetts, where Harvard, where Harvard University has set up a long-term ecological monitoring site to do a wide range of ecological research. The Center of Tropical Forest Sciences uh, and the Forest Global uh, Earth Observatory have a plot at Harvard Forest, which is part of an international network of forest sites. It is a, it's actually a geo-reference 35 hectare plot that is divided into a grid of 20 meter square quadrats. So uh, uh, David, Dave, Dave Orwig, the ecologist that we're working with, actually conducts censuses in this, uh, in, in this region uh, where he actually goes throughout this entire plot uh, since 2010 and monitors all of these hemlock trees in all of these plots. Uh, and so since 2010, in this entire 35 hectare plot, he has found that all of the hemlock trees uh, had a hemlock woolly adelgid infestation uh, in 2012. So he does the census, I believe it's every four years. Uh, and so now he's, he's currently conducting another one. And so that's why we're working alongside him uh, and hopefully being able to leverage some of the technology that we have. Um, so this kind of provides us a thorough census of the hemlock decline within a large area. And as I mentioned before, there's that added benefit uh, that we have with multiple aerial remote sensing technologies that have flown over the region in the past years that can provide some, uh, some valuable information in enhancing uh, hopefully uh, some, some detection of the hemlock woolly adelgid.
again, this data is readily available, and I encourage anybody to take a look at their website for uh, data sets that might interest you as well. So in terms of data acquisition, so we went out to the site in May of 2020, 2021, when the, ecolog when the ecologist informed us of the woolly mass, that the woolly masses were now present on the hemlock trees. We gathered uh, samples from a series of infested trees uh, from moderate to heavily infested in even a nearby uh, healthy hemlock. I took these samples back to our facility to begin doing the analysis with two, in two different instruments. But for the purpose of this analysis, I'll just only focus on uh, one of the instrument data sets. The instrument that was used in the analysis was uh, Spectral Revolution's SR6500, which is shown in the right side photo in yellow. Uh, the instrument uh, is, is unique uh, that it is actually the highest uh, resolution field operational spectral radiometer on the market with a spectral resolution of 1.5 nanometers for the UV vis and three, three nanometers for the square one and 3.8 for the square two. Uh, this measures 300 and uh, the spectral range is from 350 to 2,500 nanometers, measuring every nanometer along the way. Uh, so for taking the measurements, uh, we used our newly designed precision probe. The probe has a one millimeter field of view uh, that allows the user to measure very small targets. Uh, the hemlock needles are very small and make it a challenge to measure an individual needle with just, let's say, a leaf clip or some other four optic. But this probe uh, allows for very fine measurements. Uh, so uh, the photos on the right display the setup with the instrument and shows how you can get the precision probe very close uh, to, your, uh, to your sample to achieve an accurate measurement of the desired material. Um, the unique way this works is that there's an external light providing illumination to the target by being piped through the fiber and onto the target, while another set of fiber cores in the probe allow the energy to return back to the spectrometer. Now, for some of the uh, preliminary assessment on the data that we did collect, uh, here's a scan showing the, the, materi this, the material gathered from the hemlock leaf. Uh, this is just really for a baseline. Um, this was the first time actually using the precision probe in a vegetation application uh, because that the needles were so small we needed something with a very small field of view and if, if, if anyone has seen a hemlock vegetation the needles are very small maybe three millimeters long uh, so what i did here is i placed the precision probe directly over over the leaf uh, over the needle um, that i wanted to sample shown on the top right hand picture and acquired the spectra Looking at the photo, a user would have to be very specific on what they were measuring in case of contaminating the field of view with either maybe the, the branch or the twig um, that is also attached to the, to the needle there. So currently we have the probe set up with this fixed mount and it made it easy to kind of swivel around the probe to different, tar uh, to different constituents that we wanted to measure. And then down below is just one of those vegetation scans that probably hopefully many of you are familiar with uh, just to kind of showcase the response from using this four optic. Now using the same technique as I did for getting the vegetation spectra, I went ahead and carefully removed the white woolly substance shown in the photo uh, on the top right that was, that was present on that sample shown on the upper left. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the presence of a dry white woolly material appear on, typically appear on the young twigs of hemlocks when they're heavily infested. So this wool is, is most abundant in the spring uh, when egg masses are present. As they feed, their woolly covering expands and it kind of resembles the, the, the tip of uh, like a cotton swab um, and kind of very delicate to the touch. This sample that I have here is actually from one of the very heavily infested hemlock trees, uh, which is what, which was covered extensively with some of the, with the, much of this woolly substance. Uh, again, this is one of those telltale signs of the infestations themselves. Now, looking below, there is the the results of this uh, the spectra from just the woolly uh, material. So, what can be seen from the scan is definitely some distinguishing features pertaining uh, to the spectral fingerprint of the woolly substance. So this is potentially some key information. Uh, so, so some potentially key information is around that 1731 nanometer mark and roughly the 2351 nanometer mark. And in, in spectroscopy, some of these features are usually an indication of hydro, hydrocarbons. 
which would make sense since this, uh, this is uh, organic material. However, we haven't received a definitive answer on this analysis yet, but hope to get some feedback soon. Uh, nevertheless, by isolating this woolly substance, I think, I think we've really honed in on some very distinct features that could possibly be used in the detection uh, in the presence of the hemlock woolly adelgid at broader scales. Uh, as, as I was going through some of re the, the current research that is being conducted, I haven't really um, seen any of this uh, type of information, but again, if, if any of you have witnessed this in your observations, I'd love to get that feedback. Uh, and see if you've been able to witness some of this uh, information in, in your scans themselves. So here's just another example. Um, uh, so the next step that I actually wanted to do was to take a more representative sample that has more characteristics of what an infestation in the field would look like. So the photo in the middle uh, labeled red uh, displays the heavily infested hemlock twig with, um, you can see the woolly substance kind of bunched together there. Uh, uh, and then uh, the other one, uh, the, the blue line is the same scan, um, which uh, is a different picture of the woolly mask, but you can see that it is uh, uh, where you can see the emphasis of these absorption features from just the woolly substance, and then combine that with the red scan, which is of, of, of a more representative sample where I'm contaminating the field of view with some of the leaves, the twigs, uh, as well as the woolly substance. And you can see in this red box uh, that you can see some faint uh, absorption features there at about the 20, the 2300 nanometer. Um, and so though, though this may look faint in this scan here, I, uh, in this display here, I'll showcase some of the zoomed in features uh, so you can get a better idea of how these um, relate to one another. So finally, I have these uh, the zoomed in displays uh, with several scans that we took. Uh, all of these are of the heavily infested scans. The blue line above is still of the woolly substance, uh, uh, only, only at the top. And the rest of the scans below are just several more representative scans, uh, some with more of the leaf and some with more of the woolly substances, some targeting uh, more of the branches and the twigs as well. So I just stacked these scans together uh, and zoomed into these portions uh, of, of the spectrum to provide a better visual um, uh, on, on these detailed features. Uh, we can still see that distinct absorption uh, characteristics of that woolly substance. Now these, are, as I mentioned before, these are what you, what you can consider some mixed field of views, uh, but a more, majority of these scans can still identify that spectral fingerprint of the hemlock woolly adelgid. And hopefully looking at other, uh, other spectral data, this can potentially be a key indicator uh, of, of the hemlock woolly adelgid. So we hope to leverage this type of information going forward. Um, there's a scan right at the bottom that looks smoother than the others, uh, about a brown scan line there. Uh, this is actually, I, I, I left in the healthy vegetation uh, so that this does not have any woolly substance. Um, in this scan. So just to illustrate the differences between the samples that did and did not have hemlock woolly adelgid present. So in conclusion, uh, being able to monitor that hemlock woolly adelgid is key for foresters and ecologists to better understand its presence and impact. Uh, and utilizing some of this remote sensing data have become uh, an important tool, uh, especially with a variety of different sensors that can be extremely useful in, in detecting the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, however, you know, there's key features of the hemlock woolly adelgid that are tricky and have to be timed just right. So since there are only appearances that are during the spring and fall seasons, uh, using landscape scale observations at the right time may be able to capture some of this more useful information on the presence of the hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, I still haven't gone through those data sets that they have um, at Harvard Forest yet to actually time this, but hopefully I can leverage some of that information. Uh, and see if these, these absorption features are present. Uh, again, using some of these high resolution instruments, this is what I started off with. Uh, it, I'm, I'm gonna hopefully leverage and exploit some of these key features at the 1731 nanometer mark and the 2231 nanometer mark, which can provide some key in indications on the actual inf infestation and potentially the stage, uh, potentially the stages of those infestations as well. Uh, rather than looking at just the remotely sensed data at broader scales that can, you know, just highlight some of the, uh, the, the vigor of the hemlock stands. So on the right is just a picture of David Orwig, 
uh, he's he's the man that we were working with who who gets up close and personal with these uh, with these trees and uh, really helps us on on indicating the exact infestation level stages. So he's a great resource, uh, and I highly recommend for those that don't that haven't seen his research to to take a look. Um, he has an, an extensive history in the hemlock woolly, uh, investigating the hemlock woolly delgate in particular. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, some of the future work um, that we're going to be conducting. Uh, so the next seasonal exposure, as uh, Dave let us know, uh, was going to be back in the fall. So hopefully we can actually go out there into the field with, with a variety of instruments and conduct more observations with larger fields of views. So hopefully observe these absorption features at the 1321 and the 2231 nanometer mark. Uh, this this will be obviously a different experience from just doing this in the lab. So uh, taking taking this to the field will hopefully help uh, validate some of this information. Uh, luckily at Harvard Forest, uh, they have a hemlock tower that reaches about 30 meters or higher into the canopy, as shown in the picture on the on the right. Uh, the tower extends beyond the, the canopies of the hemlock trees, so we hope to gather some canopy measurements and see about combining that information with some well-timed flyover campaigns in the past or ones that might be conduct, uh, being conducted in the future. So we hope to have some data sets available for either spring or fall to compare with the canopy measures that, that we're going to gather in the next uh, few trips. Um, so in conclusion, oh well, uh, in terms of some feedback, um, since a lot of you might be interested in this uh, type of uh, investigation or you're currently conducting your own hemlock woolly adelgid investigations, I'd love to hear back from you. Maybe you can email me uh, if you'd like to see some of, more of these data sets. Uh, I could always share that and then we can continue this conversation. Um, potentially, you can hopefully help me and Dave on, on specific techniques that might be helpful as well going forward in the fall and in the spring uh, to help figure out another uh, uh, other methods in the detection of the hemlock woolly intelligence. So feel free to contact me. My contact is there at the bottom.